Hello, good afternoon. My name is Tiziana Rossetto, and I'm going to talk to you about tsunami, as Sam has just mentioned. Um, tsunami are extremely long waves that are generated by undersea earthquakes. Um, they have a very long wavelength, and they conserve their energy as they travel across the oceans at the speed of a jet plane. They then hit the uh, coastline, inundating land, causing devastation and life loss. Um, tsunamis are rare events, but we know of about 2,000 or so that have happened across the world over history, including one that actually affected the, Brussels, uh, the Belgian coast in 1939. So you thought you were safe, but uh, you're not. <laughs> okay, it was a very small tsunami. Um, but I think what we forget is actually over the last 10 years, we have had five major damaging tsunami uh, that have claimed the lives of 300,000 people, most of these during the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. 300,000 people, that's approximately 30,000 people dying a year. The equivalent of the number of people who die from road accidents across the whole of Europe. Um, these are large numbers, uh, more so in the most recent tsunami that hit Japan in 2011. Um, it caused a total economic loss that's estimated, and it's still an underestimate, at 235 billion US dollars. It's the most costly natural disaster in uh, human history. With these figures in mind, um, think forward, think to the future, think about the fact that sea levels are rising, um, that our population is growing, and that we are inhabiting coastlines more and more. In fact, it's projected that there'll be 23 trillion euros worth of assets exposed to coastal flooding by 2070 and 150 million people. So in my opinion, and I hope it's yours as well, we need to start to protect our populations and our assets from these large natural hazards. How do we do this? We need to assess our buildings, our infrastructure, protect the critical infrastructure that there is with coastal defenses, and start planning tsunami evacuations. The first step towards this is a better understanding of how tsunami behave near and onshore. And as an engineer, in order to design buildings, design coastal defenses, I also need to know how tsunamis interact with, uh, with these sorts of buildings. And here we come across a problem, or let's say a challenge. Um, there is very little understanding as to how tsunamis behave near shore, and we all know almost nothing about how they interact with buildings. Why is this? As I said before, tsunami are very rare events. So observational data from real events is actually lacking. We only have one record of a tsunami trace from the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. Only a very little amount of information on engineered structures was available before the, um, the Japan event in 2011. And still, the data we have isn't, isn't large. If we look to numerical models of flow, they're fantastic for predicting how a tsunami propagates from the source, so from where the earthquake triggers it, to the coastline. Um, and indeed, numerical models are used to, um, to send out tsunami warnings. However, these models break down as the tsunami hits um, the shoreline, as it inundates the land, because of the complex fluid processes that need to be simulated. Moreover, these numerical models are almost incapable of taking into account the presence of structures in the flow. So, if numerical models don't work, if we have little observations, we resort to experiments. But even here, we find that existing experiments have, uh, are of limited use. Why is this? Well, they simply don't create tsunami-like waves. Wave makers that have been used to date are composed of, in very simple terms, a paddle attached to a piston. They create a wave by pushing the water within a flume. So the, the length of the wave that they can generate is determined by the length of the arm of the piston. You can only push the water as far as the arm extends. Um, the problem is that tsunami in real life have a wave period of around 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, it's very difficult to recreate in a small laboratory scale. And these 
paddle wave makers um, can only generate tsunami which are around two minutes in length, therefore are unrepresentative of the very damaging events um, that we're trying to reproduce. Um, moreover, they're unable to recreate what we're seeing here, which is a trough-led tsunami. Um, so the images that I'm showing you here show that the sea recedes, goes out before the crest of the wave arrives. And this is a characteristic of, of some tsunami waves. Um, and that is basically caused by the trough of the wave, the depression part, arriving before the crest, uh, the crest being more damaging. Um, so in 2007, um, I got together with uh, a team from HR Wallingford, which is the UK's premier coastal engineering testing facility. And we started to brainstorm about how we could generate tsunami at a laboratory scale. And this is what we came up with, a pneumatic tsunami generator. Now, that sounds very cool. Um, <laughs> it really translates into a big blue tank, as you can see from the image here. So it's not all that technical or high tech, but it's a very simple idea. The tank is very big. Um, and is attached to a large fan. What the fan does is it extracts the air from the tank and the water level in the tank rises. Um, if you open an air valve, the air comes in, the water level drops. The water in the tank can escape from the, um, uh, from the tank through an opening at its base, creating a wave which then propagates along a flume. In our case, the flume is 45 meters long. Um, along a bathymetry, so along a slope, and can hit structures and model buildings that we put there and we monitor. Um, the principle is very simple. It's, it's exactly the same thing as what you've done as a child when you're playing with a straw in your, uh, your fizzy drink, for example, and you suck up the water in the straw, you put your uh, thumb on the top, and you're suspending the liquid there. When you remove your thumb from the straw, the liquid falls down, and you're creating a mini tsunami in your cup. Um, a fizzy one if you're dealing with lemonade. <laughs> um, so here are some images um, of, of the facility itself, the flumes, um, and uh, of, of the tsunami generator creating a wave. Um, and one of the really unique aspects of our facility is the fact that we can suck up water, so we can you know, um, suck in the water, creating actually a trough-led wave. Um, and we're the only facility that can do this. So you've actually seen the water recede from the seawall in, um, in this video, and that's actually a trough-led wave arriving at the seawall before the crest comes and compromises the integrity of the seawall, um, damaging it and flooding the structures behind. Because we can move such large volumes of water, we are also able to create extremely long waves. The wave that you're seeing here um, is actually 170 seconds at model scale. That translates into a 20-minute tsunami. So we are actually creating tsunami-like waves. And this is opening all sorts of new frontiers for us um, in terms of understanding tsunami. In our experiments, we also um, put in these little model buildings. Again, it doesn't look that exciting. It's a box. But the box has got sensors in it, which tell us what the pressures are and what the forces are that are acting on the box when the tsunami hits it. So far, we've carried out a limited number of tests with funding from the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council in the UK, uh, which has shown us that tsunami, or these very, very long waves, behave very differently from the short waves that so far we've been able to reproduce in the lab. For example, in the case of run-up, Run-up is a parameter that describes the inundation in land, the extent of inundation of a tsunami, and it's, it's used to plan uh, tsunami evacuation sites, so how much of an area do we need to um, evacuate. So it's an important parameter. We see that it scales for short waves with the amplitude of the wave, and for our long waves with the root of the amplitude. This provides different estimates of run-up. Um, we also see that the equations that we can derive for crest-led waves and for trough-led waves are different. So the shape of the wave influences how much the tsunami inundates the land. Um, in the case of our experiments on buildings, what we find is that our very long waves actually impart just slightly smaller peak forces than the shorter waves. Um, so we get slightly lower peak forces, but these are actually applied for a very, very 
much longer period of time. Um, and that has an influence on how we analyze buildings. We see two regimes of flow um, which uh, change within a single wave. So it's, it's not uh, that simple. Um, and yet by observing this, we've come up with um, mathematical frameworks that allow us to predict what the forces are on buildings, um, even just knowing what the incident flow is. These can be used together with numerical models, even if they don't um, include buildings, to say, well, if this flow happens, what are the forces on the building? So it's quite a powerful tool. Um, as I said before, it's a limited number of experiments that we've based these observations on, and we have a few more observations as well on top of this. Um, but the next stage is to go bigger and better. With funding from the European Research Council, we are now moving into a 70-meter long flume, which is four meters wide, and we are creating a much more powerful tsunami generator. This will allow us to look at coastal defense structures at a scale that is realistic, that we can reproduce the real physics, um, and therefore come up with some engineering guidance on how we should be designing these structures. We will also be able to look at clusters of buildings um, and the flow between these. And this is a much more realistic um, type of experiment than just looking at a single building. You know, we are looking at urban areas, and that's what we want to be trying to assess. So the aim of this work essentially is to provide the engineering tools to develop a more resilient tsunami, a uh, more resilient community to tsunami. Um, and really, we are pushing for these changes to happen. We really want um, to, that communities get prepared, that local government take actions to protect critical infrastructure, so that scenes like this are not repeated in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna.